Welcome. Welcome to the 14th General Assembly of the Environment for Development Initiative. We're still very sad that we're not in Kochi in India, but we're trying to make the best out of the current suboptimal situation here. And that is to have a packed but short General Assembly. So can we have the, the program for the General Assembly, David? Yes, it's gonna be packed. We'll start uh, with, uh, with our chair, Pam Fiedman, putting EFD in perspective. I will give you a bit of an update where uh, EFD stands today and the implications of her mission. Franklin will tell us uh, who has won our awards this year. Rebecca will give us an update of the gender situation in the network. We'll hear from Remedius on some exciting policy impact experiences EFD has had in Tanzania. And this will be followed by an invitation to the next annual meeting that we hope will be held in, uh, on the Tanzanian shores of Lake Victoria a year from now. So David, can we skip the, the slides now? And I'll, um, it'll be my pleasure to introduce our chair. Uh, Professor Pam Fehrman, she used to be uh, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Gothenburg. He, she has now served as President for the International Association of Universities and she has many other duties, but most importantly, she's the Chair of the EFD Board. And Pam has proven to be not only our greatest supporter and a rock for me personally to lean on in my work as, as Director, but also in a very, very deep sense, sharing all the ideals and visions that EFD stands for. So please speak to us, Pam Fehrman. Floor is Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I really had looked forward to meet you all in real this year, but uh, things have changed our lives and uh, we have stopped mobility and physical interactions. I look forward in one year from now that that will be possible. Higher education was immediately and very dramatically hit by the pandemic and with almost all campuses around the world closed, education and most other activities went online. And the already ongoing transformations to digitalize higher education accelerated and institution, I would say, showed a great capacity and flexibility to change. Flexibility and very often questioned by politicians and social actors. One positive consequence with development of ongoing online is the extended opportunities for international participation in meetings and in discussions. International cooperation by sharing and exchange knowledge in research and education is of utmost importance for the academia to fulfill its role to empower societies to take the actions to meet societal needs for sustainable development, to empower our societies for local needs and with the global responsibility. However, the pandemic has also clarified the great difference in the conditions for digitalizations, not least in terms of infrastructure, both within the academia, but also in societies. And thus we see a great inequality in taking actions and ensuring capacity building in all societies and to share and exchange knowledge. This is a decade of actions to realize Agenda 2030 through the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And United Nations has declared that higher education are key actors in the Agenda 2030. And that has been ratified by governments in 193 countries. And thus there is a governmental responsibility to promote and support higher education, to recognize higher education as a common good. The International Association of University, uh, where I'm the president, is a global association, uh, university affiliated and a common global voice to UNESCO. And we perform in April a global survey to learn about consequences uh, on higher education by the pandemic in a very early stage. And from this survey and follow up global webinars and policy discussions, we learned about risk of increased inequality, inequality in both research and education. However, there are positive reportings and one is an increased interest from and interactions with governments and decision makers. Recognition of the knowledge and competence actually found in academia. 
although this is not true in all countries. So let us together see opportunities in that interest and a step forward for increased support for higher education as a common good and respect and trust a knowledge based on science and proven experience. Cooperation, cohesion, and less of competition with the, within the academic sector and between academia and private and public sector is crucial for the relevance of higher education in society. While cooperation between academic institutions is national and international, cooperation with external stakeholders in civil society is mainly local and regional. And the local mission of academia through societal cooperation is crucial for empowering societies to take actions for sustainable development. And this cooperation needs a global perspective and must build on mutual interest, trust and respect for each other's goals, prerequisites and legislations. The relevance of academia in societal development is increasingly voiced and supported by higher education organizations and policymakers, including United European Union, UNESCO, Commonwealth, UN, etc. And UNESCO has an ongoing initiative for the future of higher education, raising those perspectives. And yesterday, the European Higher Education Area organized a ministerial meeting to adopt a common key on higher education and with the strong expressions of the value of higher education and need of cooperation. A great concern for the future of higher education is the growing distrust and respect for and value of the fundamental principles that form a base for the unique role in research and education and the relation to quality in higher education. It includes academic freedom, institutional autonomy, societal responsibility, equity, maintain and work for respect for ethical perspectives and tolerance for diversity. The future of higher education 2030 and beyond will depend on societal understanding of the value and unique role of higher education for sustainable development, both locally and with global perspectives. So actions needed for promoting and supporting the relevance of academia for realizing 2030 agenda and beyond are cooperation, cohesion within the higher education sector to take actions to increase awareness, understanding and value of higher education for sustainable societal development. And this to politicians and policymakers and also in society at large. This includes the understanding and support for the fundamental principles, including academic freedom as a base for its fulfillment. Government and policymakers provided with insight and understanding of higher education as a common good and part of the whole educational ecosystem to take actions to defend academic freedom and promote and support academia. Actions to develop cooperation between higher education and society, which build on mutual trust in and respect for each other's goals and legal perspectives, and also to recognize each other's needs and demands. A mutual understanding and trustful collaboration will empower the society with knowledge and competence to take actions to meet societal challenges. Actions are needed to transform academia to take on its societal, societal responsibility locally and globally, and including the technology development. So in summary, cooperation and cohesion and academic freedom must be guiding the development and the future of higher education through this decade of action to 2030 and beyond. And I would say that EFT is already taking actions along this line and has the advantage of a long-term experience in sharing knowledge and be part of capacity building network needed for sustainable development that saves our planet. And I look forward to work with you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Pang. And it's, it's, uh, it's so striking to hear your perspective, which is much broader than ours. And, and the fact that despite the fact that we kind of trying to do what, what we're trying to do from the bottom up, we actually come to exactly the same uh, conclusions in, in terms of, of what is needed. So, so let me uh, all update you a little bit on what uh, uh, EFD is doing uh, these days. Uh, and, and much of this is actually in response to uh, the kinds of call of action that, that Pam is uh, mentioning. So 2020 has been a very event eventful year for EFD. Um, some of you were here when the evaluation was presented, the external evaluation of EFD in January uh, 2020. And many of you met the evaluation team during our annual meeting in Bogota last year. So the, the, the substantial review that they did uh, of the EFD uh, centers, they showed that, that a lot has happened. And the same evaluation team actually evaluated the EFD uh, some five years ago. And they showed that a lot of the centers have improved immensely over this period. And uh, some of the centers are actually holding very, very high international standard. But the evaluation also pointed out a number of areas that we could improve on. Uh, the outcome of the evaluation has been used a lot in, in uh, finalizing our five-year strategy. This strategy work was to, started by the centers many uh, years ago, and I would really like to thank Pam Friedman and the others on the board for their help and guidance in finalizing it. So the strategy has been the basis, and also the evaluation has been uh, the basis for a consolidated proposal to CEDA that is currently being uh, appraised. Actually, we, we had a meeting with our desk officer at CEDA this morning and, and they're hard at work at this and we hope to have a green light from CEDA by early uh, December. Uh, so please, please uh, keep your fingers crossed until then for a continued support from CEDA underlying our whole program. So when we took stock of the valuation, what is happening in society, um, we have proposed some new uh, uh, venues of change. So here are some of the things that are in the pipeline and, and I'm so happy and proud that they are actually uh, meeting some of the, the calls that uh, Pam was uh, talking about. First of all, uh, if you wants to invest more in the kind of collaborative academic programs that Pam talked about, um, many of you are actually uh, now involved in teacher training run by uh, Teaching Science Schools and our colleagues here. And uh, some of you are also involved in developing courses for our collaborative program on climate change and sustainable development. So this whole kind of academic effort is uh, led by Edwin Muchapondo and Eric uh, Stane, uh, but I know that many, many of you uh, both here and around the world are, are involved. Um, another um, very exciting program that is taking that step further is one that is about to start funded by another department at CEDA called Capacity Development Department. And it focuses on support of senior civil servants in East Africa on the implementation of inclusive green economy. And there's another aspect of this uh, program that is really uh, exciting. And that is that it will en enable uh, policymakers from multiple countries to have peer learning in between each other's. And this is, of course, a thing that, that many discussed and some brought up a special meeting on in, in Bogota. So we, we really believe that this will also have knock-on effects and be more visible in our collaborative programs in the future that will enable not only South-South-North collaboration between researchers, uh, but also uh, pr practitioners. So we call that a special peer learning initiative within the EFD. The evaluation also focused on, on the need for more uh, network services within the EFD. So we will have an increased focus on that in the next uh, funding period. And I hope that we hear from the EFD Global Hub in Gothenburg will be able to support you all in the network with increased coordination and support cooperation, uh, also for more South-South interaction. And then, not least, we should take more advantage of, of the uh, wonders of virtual communication, exactly that we are doing now. 
So we are soon about to move into the rest of the program, but before I do that, I'll try to remind, uh, I would like to uh, remind you all that after the parallel session today, there will also be a kind of a virtual social mingle session afterwards. So you will receive uh, links in um, your chats for the parallel sessions on how to, to reach the, the social event after, it's because we are missing that a lot. Now, uh, David, can we put up the, the, the program, or rather the next one on the program is uh, Franklin Amakwa Mensa, our distinguished uh, research um, manager, because he, together with the research committee, has selected the awardees for the academic prizes uh, from EFD for this year. So please take it away, Franklin. Uh, thank you, Gunnar. And now to the awards. So we have two main awards to present. And the first one is going to be the Gunnar Charlene's Best Master Thesis Award. And mostly what we do is the host uh, center is supposed to nominate uh, two or three research uh, thesis for us, to, for us to evaluate. But for this year, since the program has been held virtually, we ask centers to nominate one thesis to be evaluated by the committee. And for this year, we had about six nomination from six centers. We have Ghana, we have Chile, we have Colombia, we have Tanzania and Vietnam. And well, the key things we consider are the rigor in application of environmental economics, relevant in applying policy to reduce poverty and increasing sustainability. And then next criteria is clear, clarity in writing that makes the test easily accessible and easy fun to read. So these, these are the criteria used in selecting the winner. And the second award is the Peter, Peter Beck's Best Discussion Paper Award. And this is based on, it's selected based on the discussion paper which has been published from 2019 November to uh, October this year. So that's the time frame for evaluation. And we consider uh, research uh, discussion papers which involves researchers from the global south and also thus discussion papers should be EFD funded and the young researcher should be the lead of this paper but that's the key things we consider and also we consider the policy relevance of this paper and in terms of policy relevant we also consider whether or not the paper just submitted a policy brief right a short brief which makes it much easy for non Academ uh, academics to read. We also consider the research design and the analysis. And here we want to thank the individuals, generous con contribution from individuals who have contributed in making this award successful. So now to the award. So we start with the master's thesis. And for this year, the award winner is based in Colombia. And the paper, the thesis is about the double fence, overlapping institutions and deforestation in the Colombian Amazon. And the winner is Camilo de los Rios Reda. So I'm going to invite Camilo to give a short summary of what his thesis is about. So Camilo, can you please un uh, unmute yourself and put on your Hi. video? Hi, everybody. Thanks, Franklin, for, for the introduction. Um, well, I, I estimated the impact of an overlap between a protected area and an indigenous reserve, uh, that is the overlapping uh, institutions, uh, under the deforestation inside the indigenous reserves uh, in the Colombian Amazon. And what I found is that the extra legal protection granted by the protected area really helps to reduce deforestation um, inside indigenous reserves. Um, my results simply speak to the policymakers that are trying to create environmental policies that might affect local governance. And the simple message is that we can actually create policies that complement efforts between central and local governments without undermining um, either the environmental and sustainability goals of those policies, nor the strength of local governance to respond to them. Um, thank you. Right, thank you so much. Thank you so much. So now we're moving on to the discussion paper award. So we shortlisted for papers to the committee to evaluate. And these are projects being funded by EFD. So the first one 
is can climate information salvage livelihood in arid and semi-arid lands and evaluation of assets use and impact in Namibia. And the second paper is about evaluating water purification services of forests, a production function approach using the panel data from uh, Chinese, uh, China's uh, Xinhuan province. The third one is about competition and gender in the lab versus that of the field. Experiments with upgrade renewable energy entrepreneurs in rural Rwanda. And the fourth one is about weather uncertainty and demand for information in agriculture technology adaptation, the case of Namibia. So upon the evaluation from the committee, the committee decided to award the paper, which is called uh, the paper on the evaluation, e evaluation of water purification services of forest, a production function approach using panel data from uh, Chinese Shenzhen province. So we're inviting Yol Yan Liu to give a short summary of his paper. Thanks, Franklin. Um, hello, everybody. This is Zhao Yang Liu. Um, I'm also known by my nickname Liu, L-E-O. And it's my great pleasure and honor indeed to receive the Best Discussion Paper Award. Uh, EFD has many top class early career researchers. So it's very exciting indeed to know that uh, my paper gets recognition uh, from EFD. Uh, my paper looks at the monetary value of water purification services of forests. Uh, the basic idea is that um, better forest cover helps improve water quality, and therefore it would be easier and cheaper to treat such water into drinking water. And the cost saving can be regarded as at least part of the monetary value of the water purification services of forests. And this study is an output of the Ecosystem Services Accounting for Development Project, or the ESA4D project. And I would like to express my sincere appreciation to Dr. Yu Hazi Kamaki, um, Professor Jin Tao Xu, um, Cindy Burke, and an anonymous reviewer from the EFD discussion paper series for their very kind and very valuable help with my paper. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Guna, can you please take over? You are muted, please. Aha. Yes, thank you so much, Franklin. And let's move on in the program. And we have uh, an exciting new uh, content uh, this year. Uh, gender and gender e e equality is, of course, high on our agenda. And this is also something that our donors are pushing very, very hard. So we have we felt the need to go back to basics and see what kind of academic uh, in environments are we really working in? So I would like to invite Rebecca Klege to come on here because many of you have received her mails and you have responded to her. So here's the first uh, uh, update on the situation when it comes to uh, gender equality in our network. Rebecca, please come, come, come online. Thank you, Guna. So let's say I'm here to give the state of affairs of gender when it comes to our EFD network and our host institution. Next slide, please. Uh, so um, gender disparities in academia and economics for that matter remains a challenge. And studies have shown that uh, although the economics profession has made, uh, made progress in the late 1990s to early 2000s, from 2009, this progress has actually been stalled. And what is interesting to know is that underrepresentation of women in economics is shown to be larger than that of the traditional STEM subjects, which is very worrying. And because of this, we've had a lot of global discussions and formation of new initiatives. I can point to uh, women in economics in Denmark uh, that was established uh, somewhere this year. We also have the Women in Economics Initiative uh, that started making uh, some grounding last year. And we have our own Women in Environmental Economics for Development to help address these issues. If you go to the traditional media, so we have a lot of articles uh, springing up. And one that really caught my attention this year is when the conversation uh, during the International Women's Day, instead of celebrating uh, women in economics, uh, they decided to put out an article that addressed uh, why women in economics have little to celebrate. Next slide, please. 
Uh, so where does EFD stand? So if we look at the EFD network, uh, especially within our senior research fellows, we see this huge gender gap. And apart from India and the Kenyan center that has equal representation of uh, men and women, uh, all the others are lacking behind when it comes to female representation. Uh, but the good news here is that the gap uh, is very encouraging when we look at uh, junior researchers across our centers. Uh, this means that if we put more efforts on female researchers across our junior, uh, at the junior level, uh, we might uh, be able to bridge this gap. So we might have to devote some more resources towards the junior, uh, female junior researchers and find a way to retain them so that they can move up the ladder. Uh, however, uh, the way EFD centers are structured is such that we are usually based in host institutions, mostly in economics departments. And for those that are operating a network system, they are also often uh, dominated by economists. And that means that to ask the difficult questions or the difficult gender questions, we will, want, we will need a baseline data at the host institution levels. So this year, uh, EFD decided to initiate a project, and this project was to examine the gender distribution uh, in EFD-affiliated economics department and also obtain insights for, uh, from EFD members and use existing literature to develop solutions. Uh, to highlight on the existing uh, literature, we really have a huge uh, um, information when it comes to female representation across uh, the economics uh, profession. But what, is, uh, what we lack is the representation in global, uh, the Global South. So with the Global South, you realize that most of the studies that has been conducted are all based in the US or Europe. And that means that we don't really have, we have a huge uh, data gap when it comes to the Global South. The long-term goal of EFD is to position EFD in such a way that we can build a data hub and be a first point of call on issues related to female representation in economics for uh, countries in the global south. Um, and to do this, next slide, please. Uh, we decided to approach our EFD directors to provide us with information uh, on gender across their, um, all the host institutions that they are based in. So we had a couple of universities where we were able to obtain data on the gender distribution of, um, let's say, lecturers or um, workers across the, uh, across the um, economics department. And you can see from the bar graph that uh, we still have this huge uh, gender gap when it comes to representation of females across um, uh, economics departments in host institutions. So we also conducted a crowdsourcing survey where we just wanted to conduct a preliminary um, survey to try to get ideas from our network to see what they think when it comes to gender representation. So we sent out a survey where we asked people whether they were happy about the gender distribution in their host institutions. And the answer that 65% uh, felt like we have an issue when it comes to gender representation, they were not happy. Uh, at their host institution. And uh, when we further, we narrowed this down to EFD centers compared to their host institution, the um, responses differed a bit, uh, pointing to the fact that maybe EFD might be doing much better, but it still remains that uh, gender issues remain a, a challenge. I just want to highlight that out of this, this uh, the number of people that responded to our survey, majority, majority of them were men. Uh, that gives us an idea that even the dominant health is in support of the fact that uh, gender remains an issue when it comes to our centers. Next slide, please. Uh, so what's the way forward? In the survey, we also asked our respondents to give us an indication or suggest ways we can close the gender gap within the EFD network. And based on their answers, I was able to develop the word cloud. Uh, the larger the words, the more uh, the often it was used. Uh, so we have suggestions such as opportunities, training, uh, networking, re more research, uh, mentoring, collaboration. And I'm personally familiar with the um, 
gender literature when it comes to uh, female economics or the, uh, the economics profession. So what I did was go into the literature and see the various suggestions that had uh, been uh, outlined. And I realized that the suggestion that our members gave actually uh, aligned with what we have in the existing literature that is more <clears throat> based in uh, developed countries. So you can also see that for the existing literature, we have um, um, suggestions such as role modeling, mentoring, diversity training, and gender quotas. And this points to the fact that um, we can also learn a lot from the existing literature as we progress on this project. Next slide, please. Yeah, so to wrap up, I'd like to say a very big thank you to all the directors that responded to my numerous emails uh, for providing me with a lot of data. And secondly, to the nine directors that personally spoke to me, had interviews with me, I'm very happy. Those who have not yet spoken to me, I would love to speak to you. So please respond to my emails. And, <laughs> and I would like to conclude to say that the goal to close the gender gap, it's a complex one. And given that we have institutional barriers, we will need the support of all members. It is very vital for you to collaborate so that we can bridge the gap. And to the left, of, uh, you can see this picture that I just posted to the left of your screen. Uh, my question to you is to where do we go from here? Are we uh, proposing equality or equity in EFG uh, our, um, amongst our network. This is something I would like all of you to think about. And let me just highlight that we have an upcoming, for the first time, EFG has an upcoming uh, comprehensive gender report. Uh, and I will, as many of you that can get hold of this uh, report, please do. And let's keep the conversation going. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rebecca. And this is very exciting work that is uh, still ongoing. Uh, so you will see, you will all hear much more about this in, in the near future. Okay, so uh, now we change uh, quickly again to um, to Remedius, who will come online and talk to us a little bit about the the policy impacts that we have seen from EFT in in Tanzania. So of course, this is something. This is what EFT is all about: to put uh, research at work. We don't have much time this year, but I thought it would be very nice to link it to our first keynote, Urvash Narain, who was talking about the World Bank role. And Remedius, tell us about all the exciting things that have happened over the last year. Uh, thanks, Guna. Um, I should first of all acknowledge that uh, EFD has done a lot um, in the past one year, both EFD Global, but uh, in Tanzania as well. I'll just try to share with you um, a few um, uh, policy efforts that we think are worth sharing with you. And uh, I'll start, to, please. I'll first of all start sharing with you uh, um, uh, knowledge that uh, EFD Tanzania, Gothenburg have had to be part and parcel of preparation of the Tanzania Country Environmental Assessment Report which uh, started back in 2018, when we got invited to be part and parcel of this journey. So the main objective um, of this report was basically to, su to support the government of Tanzania in analyzing critical environmental and natural resources challenges in the country and provide policy recommendations on how to address this. So um, the government of Tanzania have had a number of uh, environment-related uh, reports, but none of them had given a much uh, rich analysis uh, to better understand the extent of the challenges, but also pinpoint the priorities that the, uh, the government at large would start in addressing these challenges and pathways towards addressing such challenges. So we were privileged to be part of an excellent technical team uh, together with World Bank Group, uh, uh, led by World Bank Tanzania, but, uh, and the folks at the Gothenburg in Tanzania. So um, the nature of this, uh, of this uh, preparation of country environmental analysis was quite participatory. And this is what brings the spice and, uh, uh, and um, um, appetite to EFD uh, involvement. That from the very beginning, uh, from understanding the key environmental challenges in the country, to drafting the report, to sharing preliminary findings, it was throughout the process involving all the uh, key stakeholders in the government from the MDAs, ministry, department, and agencies of the government, but all down to the local government uh, um, authorities, non-government organizations, civil society, but as well as the private sector. So the first, um, next slide, um, next slide, please. 
So during the process um, uh, in 2019, it was important first, we have a very clear understanding of the extent of environmental challenges in the country. So in 2019, uh, we devoted effort um, towards what we call as stock taking uh, process. So this involved a, a, a deep, deep understanding of all key environmental challenges in the country, uh, trying to understand the magnitude, but also the implication of all these challenges across a wide array of uh, outcome indicators. And the output for this is what we call as Country Environmental Analysis Report 1. Uh, this was the output in phase one of the engagement. But in the second phase, um, um, next slide. Uh, as part of the outcome in the first phase, um, we had to prioritize, the government had to prioritize on, on what should we start with and what uh, issues should we start addressing. And charcoal uh, consumption and household energy use in particular became as a key and a critical issue that all stakeholders agree that we should start with that. And specifically because charcoal use uh, comes uh, along with a number of uh, environmental challenges that go beyond energy consumption itself. So speaking of indoor air pollution and outdoor air pollution, when it comes to charcoal production, for example, but when we speak of the deforestation number of uh, trees that are cut down just to meet the urban um, uh, fuel demand, uh, this is not to mention the under underlying land de degradation, et cetera. So it was pertinent across all the stakeholders and, um, and government in particular, that we should give a special eye on, on charcoal use and charcoal consumption in that and how um, uh, the government could eventually uh, support the population in Tanzania towards uh, cleaner fuel. So uh, this formed the basis for the second phase. Uh, and we have focused mainly in that because out of the total charcoal produced in the country, 50% is consumed in that. So we have finalized this. This was under during uh, end of 2019 and uh, uh, 2020. So we have finalized the report. The World Bank folks are now uh, uh, just um, um, uh, fine, fine tuning the final design and uh, 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 beautif beautification of the report before it is out soon this year. So it should be shared anytime uh, from today. But the, um, the second thing that uh, I'm, I'm happy to share with you, next slide, please, um, is um, following the, um, the crisis that we are all, uh, we are all living in right now, of COVID-19. Uh, just like any other country, Tanzania was heavily hit uh, by the pandemic. And the um, uh, tourism sector, in a special way, was badly hit. So the EFD Tanzania was uh, privileged to be uh, to provide technical support to the government of Tanzania, and specifically the Minister of Natural Resources and Tourism, to, um, to support um, carry out a rapid impact assessment on the uh, impact of COVID to the sector. And uh, we, um, there was a special need to look into the tourism sector. And there is where we started because of the, uh, the importance of the sector to the Tanzanian economy. Next slide. Um, so tourism basically in Tanzania uh, carries around 15% of the GDP, but it accounts for uh, more than 40% of our total exports. So um, getting hit by COVID, it had a serious implication on the, on the economy of the Tanzanian, but also well-being of the Tanzanians in general. So EFD Tanzania provided technical support to undertaking a very rapid impact assessment of COVID-19 on the sector. But also it was important uh, that uh, the request also came from the government that just providing rapid impact assessment might not be enough. Understanding a problem without putting in place a solution might not be an ideal approach that the government would want to have. So they approached us also uh, to be part of the uh, technical team to lead, uh, to provide a technical backstop on um, designing uh, the uh, government master plan uh, for the sector recovery and sustainability master plan following the pandemic. So we were, uh, we were really pleased to be part of this process. But then uh, what is very interesting um, uh, that we often discuss in, among academics is when you come up with an impressive report and uh, the uptake of it by the policy maker becoming minimum. In this case, it was totally different. We saw an immediate uptake of the recommendations that were posted out in our report uh, at the ministry level, but the uh, recommendations that were brought up at the ministry level that felt the government felt that this would be cross-cutting. So they were applied across the sectors. This, this was uh, 
uh, a very um, uh, 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 pleasing for us to see, but also um, uh, satisfying to see that EFD could become that of uh, a support to the government at this time where all nations are, are, are struggling to get back out of the COVID uh, hits. Next slide. And um, one of the other things that I would like to share with you, uh, this uh, might not be very directly, um, 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 these are part of what we call uh, positive externalities of EFD, right? So we just established a new center for behavioral studies uh, uh, and uh, in, in Tanzania, especially at the University of Dar es Salaam, and 70% uh, of, the, of the founding members uh, of CBS are EFD fellows, and they have played a critical role in shaping out the design and establishment and fund sourcing of the center. And the center uh, is established basically to provide technical support to the government for better design, implementation, and evaluation of the programs and policies in the country. So CBS <laughs> is a champion of behavior center design, and uh, we have uh, conducted at least uh, uh, supported the government and the Minister of Finance to coming up with a behavioral intervention that could foster tax, voluntary tax compliance in Tanzania. And it has been uh, a super successful start of the first two years. So um, I'll just end up there. But as I said, there are a lot, a lot of things that uh, AFD uh, Tanzania, for example, has influenced the policy arena at this end. But uh, we all know that uh, throughout the, our centers, to what extent the AFD has had a big influence to shaping the policy and programs in our countries. Thanks, Thank Guna, and sorry for... <laughs> Thank you, Remedius. I know the feeling when you talk about something that you really love. Uh, I, I've been there, done that. So thank you so much, Remedius, and I, I think that it's no surprise now to you all that we will stick to Tanzania and we would love to come and visit you uh, next year for the annual meeting if, if we can. So please, Razak, uh, you, you promised to show us some beautiful pictures from uh, Lake Victoria and invite us, isn't it? Thank you. Thank you so much, Guna and the team. Um, yeah, my message very quick to welcome you to Tanzania and the Mwanza in particular for the 15th EFD annual meeting. And this is the hoping that next year things will come back to normal. Uh, next slide. Next slide, please. Yes, uh, EFD, as uh, we all know, it was hosted in the Department of Economics initially, but now our department has been promoted to a School of Economics. So we have a much wider visibility and therefore EFD can stand even a better position together with a, her baby CBS. So uh, we are a good link uh, with the government as Iramidus has just mentioned, uh, ministry, local government, NGO, et cetera, in the Casco. Our involvement with the government and the other private sector is very big here. And the, our expectation is um, our uh, the forthcoming annual meeting of 2021 will be able to involve uh, as much key stakeholders uh, in our meeting. Next. Next slide. Yeah, uh, just a, a very quick brief. Uh, the, the fifth EFD annual meeting was, well, it was in 2011, and this was in Arusha. You can see all the good, uh, nice picture we visited in Gorongoro and the other Banyara, etc. Next slide. And the, again, the 80s, it was in Dari's time from Arusha to the coastal site. This is all in Dar es Salaam. And we were at the, the nice beach hotel and the old people, you can see all nice people participated in this. And this time I think it was still a small group, unlike now, which is a very big group. Next slide. Next slide, please. Right, uh, so uh, the, the, the 15th annual meeting is planned to be hosted in Mwanza, and the Mwanza is a, a beside Lake Victoria. And the, if you all know Lake Victoria, it should be hosted in Mwanza because we are, have now the three uh, Lake Victoria country, one, um, Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania are all like EFD centers. So we decided that let's host, host it in, one, in Lake Victoria so that we have all participation of people within the, the, the centers. So I could say this is a, like a co-organized uh, annual meeting by the three countries because we expect huge involvement from people from Uganda and uh, uh, as well as from Kenya. So uh, the city of Mwanza is the major uh, Tanzania port on Lake Victoria and the major center for economic at the region. 
and the city make a good base for much wide explore the nearby Robondo Island National Park and as well as the national it is part of the western part of Serengeti so it means from Mwanza you can also visit Serengeti and Robondo Island next next slide yeah, you can see this, uh, the, the beauty of the lake. Uh, you can see the mass of bloom of developed water transparency. Uh, water is, in the, is now like declining. But we have a problem of fishing still there. And for those who are working on fisheries, we'll see that uh, uh, intensification of land is well, it's going on. Like, so we have a good issue that we can look at when we're in Mwanza, uh, both environmental concern, but also the leisure part. Next, next slide. Right, uh, so there are some at attraction sites. Uh, this is the Sanan Island National Park where we could see wildlife conservation challenge and human life conflict, but also uh, the wildlife uh, they would uh, get. And also this is a, there's a, a man-made uh, national uh, a park, which is recently opened by the president. This is a very good charter national park. That can be visited easily uh, from Mwanza. And also we have some traditional place of uh, the major tribe, the big tribe in Mwanza, which is Kuma uh, tribe, we could be able to visit those sites. Next. Next slide. Right, uh, we also have some famous rock. This is Bismarck rock from Mwanza, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Razak. We're really looking forward to that. You know that we love to come back to Tanzania time after time. You would be the only uh, EFD center that would have hosted three uh, annual meetings in, in that case. So we're really Thank looking you. forward to that. And, and also, uh, uh, we hope to, to also then pull in the other activities that I was telling you about before, um, the inclusive green economy and the SGA project and so on, and re really make it a very inclusive and uh, collaborative effort, not only on the research side, but also on the policy side. So we're really, really hoping that that will, will happen. And Thank you. Yeah, so please, uh, Razak and Remedis and uh, uh, Leo and Camille, you can all put on your camera so we can get some life here on, on the stage because I would like to, to start to thank you all for contributing to this. Um, even Sanna, how about that? No? <laughs> yes. And David and Samson too. Right. Yes, yeah, so I because I would like to thank you all for for uh, participating and, and contributing to this uh, to this final the general assembly. It's usually even more livelier uh, than than this. But this has been of course a, a heroic effort to pull this off uh, this virtual year. We still hope that we will be able to come back to Kochi maybe 2 years from now, but it's still in in the cards. Um Corona willing. So I'd, I'd like to, to take a, a big round of thanks to people. There's so, so, so many who have contributed to this uh, annual meeting. It actually all started many months ago when, when SETI and we need and so we started to put bigger uh, uh, workshops on online. So we've really, really learned a lot from SETI and we need and not least from Tommy Klug who was pulling that together. So then, then, of course, we have had a kind of a technical track and, and a program track here in, in making it all happen. And when it comes to the program creation, of course, the mastermind is, is Franklin with the support of, of Samuel Wakuma, who has really you know, created the, the parallel programs and so on. When it comes to the keynotes, that has been the responsibility of, of Thomas Sterner to, to uh, uh, find the best uh, keynotes. So in, in support of uh, that program creation the committee, and particularly Franklin, there have also been a lot of support from some of the collaborators, in particular, once again, City and Winnie, but also others for the review of the papers and for finding chairs and, um, and discussions and so on. And we shouldn't forget that underlying this and many other presentations is also the research committee. And some of you have realized that there is also that fifth uh, parallel uh, with, with proposals being done. So there we have, of course, uh, 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 the research committee led by Vika Damovic and, and including also Francisca Pisar, Jessica Coria, Pamela Jagger, Menale Kassi and Rini Sumanathan that have done an immense amount of work uh, heading to that. They've also been the ones uh, doing the reviews for the, the awards. 
Then you see some of them here, but they're even more behind the scenes. We have drawn completely on the, the EFD Global Hub here uh, in, in staging the, this virtual annual meeting with Franklin, Peter, David, Samson, Poe, Grace, Samuel, Sanna, and Eric Steiner. So all of this has been, and many of them have been hosting the meetings and, and, and preparing for it. We also have Peter Hansson, our new uh, web editor, who has the, also helped with that, but so many more things, interviews and setting up and, and not least managing the registrations of, of all of you. So we have been learning so much so fast here. Just a, a quick word on, on the keynotes and, and the, the chair, sir. We had Urvashi, Jan, Menal, and Faisana, fantastic keynotes, and Bayela, Thomas, Aaron uh, uh, chairing that. So we have all of these people, and then all the presenters, all the chairs, uh, all the discussants. Uh, so everybody has actually made this uh, meeting what it is. And there is actually one person, and I think that many of you have realized that by now that I've, I've uh, saved the, the, the Zoom general to last, that David Reckermann, he has done an amazing job learning everything and teaching all of us what to do, setting up each and every meeting that you've been in, uh, including so many other things. So, so a big thank you to all of you and particularly David who has been working around the clock for the last week to, to make this happen. So I hope with this that we will have a nice last stretch now with, with a last set of, of parallel sessions and that many of you join us in the mingle uh, afterwards. You'll see the links in the chat boxes and then hopefully we will meet each other virtually many, many times over the coming year, but also maybe physically in the shores of Lake Victoria on the Tanzanian side. So thank you so much, all of you.